What's up guys, Rick from DFS On Demand here with a preview for the WGC FedEx St. Jude Invitational. But before we get to that, a couple of important announcements. First of all, thanks everyone for the support for last week. Um, a lot of you know I was on my honeymoon. You guys sent out a ton of great uh, comments with support. So much appreciated. It, it, it really does mean a lot. So thank you. Um, secondly, you may have seen it on Twitter, but big kind of, uh, news from me is that I have partnered with sports grid to do an hour long golf betting show. That's right. You heard me right. So I'll, I'll continue to kind of do some previews here in specifics to betting. Um, but I have an hour long weekly show. It'll be available. Uh, first air is Tuesday nights from 7 to 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on sportsgrid.com. I think you can also find it on um, some streaming channels like Pluto. I'll have to get the full schedule, um, but you can also get it on YouTube as well. I'll make sure to tweet out the links. I think the Fantasy Network's um, YouTube channel will have it. I'll make sure to post it every week, but this is really great uh, uh, step for us as gambling, sports betting is becoming legalized across the states. Um, I'm very excited about it. They've been great to work with so far. So nothing will really change as far as the YouTube channel goes. This is just more content now that I'm focusing on everything full time. So super stoked about it. Let me know what you guys think. Make sure to, to watch it every week. It goes a long way for me. So thank you. Um, and I've got winners. So last week, um, we gave away some subscriptions to DFS on demand, which is my site. It's everything that you see, uh, in these videos, uh, today and all my videos where the tools come from. So the winners from last week are, uh, fantasy rats and drew Krupp from the YouTube video. And then Brandon, Andrew and Kane's baseball 34 from the podcast. Um, I will reach out if I have your contact information, if not shoot me an email through the website, uh, we'll get you set up with a free week of DFS on demand and we'll do the same again this week. So if you would like to win a week to DFS on demand on me, on the house, um, couple ways to enter on YouTube, make sure that you're subscribed to my channel, Rick run good, uh, like the video and comment below who, which golfer over 10,000 is going to miss the cut this week. That's it. I'll put you in a draw. Um, if you are listening to the audio version, do me a favor. Um, give me a five-star review. Say something nice about the show. I'll pull a couple from there as well. All right. I think that's everything. All very important stuff. Thanks again. Let's get on to the WGC FedEx. All right. WGC FedEx St. Jude Invitational. That's going to take a little bit to get used to. So let's talk through what has happened here so that we're all on the same page. This World Golf Championship event is is formerly the Bridgestone. So the event that was played at Firestone in Akron where Justin Thomas is the defending champion. That is the WGC event. So they've moved that to have the sponsor be the uh, FedEx St. Jude, right? That, that combination that we've seen on tour for, I don't know, forever. Um, and it's being played at TPC Southwind, which formerly hosted that FedEx St. Jude Classic. Okay. It's in Memphis. It's been uh, basically a tour stop. I think Southwind has been on the tour for decades, right? Like it's, it's a staple. Um, so they're taking a course we're very familiar with rebranding the WGC, moving it to after, uh, directly after the open championship in Memphis. Okay. So that's what's happening. So the things that you see here, um, when, when I show course history on the cheat sheet, it's actually course history, which means it's FedEx St. Jude classic history. It is not tournament history. So it's not the WGC Bridgestone. Okay. So I went with the course because I had it. Um, that's what you're seeing here. So let's, let's walk through this cheat sheet together. Um, it, it, the, the pricing actually came out pretty early. So, uh, this is kind of a first look for me too. And when we get to these fields where there's 64 guys in the field, um, you're not going to see Fowler here. You're not going to see tiger here. Uh, a couple other guys had qualified and won't play. We, uh, burned Weisberger, Lee Westwood. They're not going to tee it up. Uh, so we're, we're, we're at 64. And remember, this is a no cut event. Uh, so everyone is going to play four rounds, barring some 
uh, withdrawal or disqualification or something like that. Now, I actually want to show you something and I'll, I'll make this available to you. So if you're looking at the, if you're watching the video version of this, um, what I'm showing is an Excel spreadsheet that I'll convert to a Google Doc and I will link this in the description so you can get it and look at this yourself. But what I wanted to do is I just wanted to throw in everyone's DraftKings scoring for regular events, for WGC events, and for no cut events and see if there's just anything that pops up here. Um, <clears throat> when we talk about no cut events normally, we want birdie makers, right? So guys who make a ton of birdies over four rounds tend to score a lot better in DraftKings. Um, obviously, they don't, they're not as reliant on their finishing position. So what I did here, it's a little complicated, but I'll walk you through it. Um, every player in the field that I have enough data on, like a big enough sample size, some of the, like the Asian tour guys I, I removed, I only had like zero or one sample size for WGCs or no cut events. Um, I did the regular event. So this is every event outside of WGCs and no cut events, how many starts they have and their DraftKings average. So the way this reads is Justin Thomas averages 67.8 DraftKings points in his regular events. <clears throat> um, what I realized in a second is that this also includes events that um, guys don't make the cut. So I was comparing two rounds to four rounds and it, it wasn't gonna work itself out. So what I also did was in columns L and M over here is I have um, average DraftKings scoring when they make the cut. So basically when they play four rounds, how many DraftKings points do they score? Um, and I compared that to WGCs, which is here, and no cut events. So no cut events are the WGCs plus the Tour Championship, the BMW Championship, so the last two playoff events of the year, um, the CIMB Classic, the Hero World Challenge, the Tournament of Champions, and the CJ Cup, I believe, uh, are the no-cut events that I have data on. And I, want, I just want to see if there was anything that popped up here. And it's really no surprise, after all that, um, that Justin Thomas is the king of no cut events, right? He's won a, a handful of those events that I just mentioned. Uh, and what this basically says is that he averages 92.2 DraftKings points in no cut events. That's over 22 no cut events. Um, compare that to his, you know, his average on the PGA Tour when he makes the cut. It's 13% more in these no cut events. Um, so they see, I don't know if it's a, if it's a mindset thing, if it's just a little bit of noise, but I wanted to share it with you. Uh, there's really only what 15 guys in this field that gain in no cut events. Um, some of them very small, some of them 1%, but you see Tommy Fleetwood's name up here, Keegan's name up here, Ian Poulter, Mark Leishman, et cetera. Um, the guys that lose the most, uh, Bryson, who I actually like this week, but he's he's someone that in, in just six events has not done well in no-cut events compared to his average. Um, Jason Day hasn't done well. Patrick Reed hasn't done well. So uh, again, I'll link this to you, but I felt the need to kind of walk you through it a little bit because it's not, it's not great. And you can argue, yes, yeah, courses might be tougher, fields might be different. I, I understand all of that, but here's the data. Use it for however you would like. Okay, back to the cheat sheet here. All right, we've got six guys over $10,000, and what you're going to get this week is a, a lot of dueling narratives. You're going to hear guys be like, oh, I, I want someone who played well last week, or I want someone who missed the cut at the Open Championship because now they can fly back early, um, get acclimated. It's a long trip. It's it's a quick turnaround to go from Northern Ireland to Memphis. Uh, you know, Guys that actually missed the cut have the advantage. I don't know. I, I'm not completely against that. I, I, I understand it is a pretty rigorous travel trip, uh, quick turnaround. It depends on how they miss the cut. So there's only one guy in the, you know, above $10,000 of the six guys above 10,000 that missed the cut last week. And it's of course, Rory McIlroy. I'm, I'm obligated to discuss what actually happened last week because you need to look into, you need to take a deeper look into uh, Rory's performance at the Open Championship. Uh, very, very quickly, he shot a 79, I think, 78 or 79 on on Thursday. Um, he literally made a quad out of the gate, 
and and on one and then made a triple on 18. So he is seven over par on two holes. Um, the, you know, two through 15, he played like one under par, which would have been a great round, obviously. Um, <clears throat> additionally, I think it was on 15 or 16, he had a three foot putt that he uh, missed and then missed the 15 incher coming back. Uh, so really uh, my argument on this is kind of as follows. He played pretty exquisitely outside of two and a half holes on, uh, on Thursday. Um, then on Friday, he went out and shot the best round of the day at 66 and he missed the cut by one shot. Uh, that's the Rory that we were expecting come into Northern Ireland and compete. So I'd argue that he played 33 and a half of his 36 holes like awesome. Okay. Some of the best in the field. Um, I don't think he's going to make another quad and another triple and kind of play himself out of a, another tournament. So that is kind of my long winded spiel on Rory and, and kind of saying like, Hey, if we liked him last week, which we did, and we should have, uh, he's been playing great. Um, there's, there's no reason not to like Rory. You know, I can't really punish him for two and a half holes when he played so well on the rest of them. If we liked him last week, we have to like him again this week. He has one, the only knock in terms of course history is that he has only played here, I think in 2012 and 2010 at TPC Southwind, seventh place finish in 2012, made the cut in 2010, um, just hasn't played here since. Of the other top guys, I'm really interested to see where the ownership goes on Dustin Johnson. Um, for him, by his standards, he's been pretty disappointing over the course of the last month or so. But this course history that he has at TPC Southwind, he won the FedEx St. Jude Classic last year. He won it in 2012. He's added two more top tens in the middle there. Like he's just got great course history. Um, you know, he, he made the cut last week, but didn't do didn't do much at the at the Open Championship to be completely inspired about. It's just I'm really interested to see where where his number comes in. Um, if it looks like it's coming in pretty low, I, I'll probably move a lot of my shares to DJ. He's you, you, this is the type of guy that you can't keep down for long. Also, uh, kind of mentioned him already, but Justin Thomas, you know, excellent in no cut events. Uh, now basically back to back top tens uh, with the the 11th place finish at the British Open last week. Um, no reason not to not to move to to JT at 10-7. I'll skip down just a little bit here to the $8,000 range. And these three guys, 89, 88, and 87, um, very, very interesting. So Hideki at 89, Bryson at 88, and Adam Scott at 87, all three missed the cut last week. Uh, you probably pretty, probably could have got pretty good odds that all three of those were, were not going to miss the, or that, to miss, the, that they would miss the cut together. Um, because they've all been playing really well coming into this. Uh, this feels like a really good bounce back by low opportunity for these three guys that really jaded a lot of owners, really rubbed and, and burned a lot of lineups last week. Adam Scott specifically was one of the highest owned golfers on the slate. Um, and, and him and Bryce are the ones I'm kind of partial to. So, so Adam Scott, again, doesn't play a lot, but when he does plays well, uh, he at least has a top 10 here at TPC Southwind. Um, I don't have data on Hideki. I don't think he's ever played here. At least he hasn't since 2012. And then Bryson's got kind of a missed cut in 2017 and a 45th in 2015. So it's a little bit of a, um, you know, not a great record. But I, I like Bryson because of the things that he does. He, he's uh, rounding into form. He makes a lot of birdies. That's very valuable in a no-cut event. Adam Scott, again, like, you know, one week, in open championship type conditions, I usually let guys off the hook pretty quickly and I definitely do it after majors. So interested to see if he's able to bounce back, but I think this is a pretty significant leverage point here because these three guys burned a lot of people last week and they might, um, they might go lower owned than they probably should. I think Finau is probably $8,400, one of the uh, most incorrectly priced golfers. So he had that run where he missed a bunch of cuts in a row kind of drove his price down, hasn't really bounced back since, but now uh, 23rd to 3M, played great at the British Open, uh, third place last week, makes a lot of birdies, he can get scorching, like this is the type of scenario you want to play Tony Finau in, um, you know, he's, he's cheaper than Shane Lowry, which is kind of crazy, uh, cheaper than, I don't know who else I'd want to play, 
I mean, I guess I guess he's I guess he's fairly priced against his peers, but 8400 uh, just feels too low when you go to actually construct some of these lineups. Um, you know, only three hundred dollars more than like Louis or something, or even Patrick Reed. Like, like I just think that there's there's other guys that um, that that Tony should probably be priced above. I think he's a couple hundred dollars too low here. And real quick here before um, I'll just run through a couple before we move on to uh, the other tools here. Uh, Rafa Cabrera Bayo again, kind of a bounce back situation where he missed the cut last week. He's got a fourth place finish here two years ago. Putnam um, has played well recently. That's a fourth at the Scottish Open, made the cut at the Open Championship. He had a second place finish at the St. Jude last year. Um, even Ches Reeve, who's missed two cuts in a row, has good history here. Billy Horschel will move a, a lot of guys down here in the mid sevens because of his great TPC Southwind history. He's got, he had four straight top tens from 2013 to 2017. So I think he'll move the needle a little bit. Um, Phil also does have great uh, course history, but just so, so bad recently. It would be tough to fire him up. Um, interested in Kisner at, at 72. He's, I think better than the rest of his guys in this range. We've seen him pop off in big time events before. Um, and that's probably it for the cheat sheet. Let's move over to strokes gained here for a second. Or actually, I guess we'll go to the, um, I think the key stats is probably more important here because we do have such great history at TPC Southwind. So if you're new to this, this is that correlation model that we run every single week for every course on the tour where we look at years and years of history to see who has um, what skill sets turn into the most draft Kings points for each course. And there's some really interesting ones here. Um, so if we go to the highest ranked stats, um, strokes gained approach is the most important stat. I'm sorry. I shouldn't say that. Uh, strokes gained approach is mo more important at TPC Southwind than any other course on the PGA tour according to this regression model. And you see the the other stats that also rank highly are all approach and green and regulation stats. So I want to look at these second shot players. It's, it's a very long par 70 course that we have this week. And, um, you know, it, it really just ends up being a, a second shot, a second shot, uh, contest here. So let's look at some of these guys. So let's sort by strokes gained approach. And, the leaders in the field, and there's one guy who really just laps the field here. It's it's Henrik Stenson. So Stenson at 9,100, uh, pretty significantly the best player in approach um, in the field. He doesn't make a ton of birdies, unfortunately. Um, but I really I really like Stenson just personally. I play him a lot. Um, then you get guys that are absolutely built for no cut events. So here's, here's the two Hideki at 89. I guess he's going to be in everybody's lineup. Hideki at 8,900 is the second best approach player in the field. He makes a ton of birdies. Uh, he doesn't make a lot of bogeys. We have seen him go low and, and win WGCs and he does well at no cut events. Um, I, he's going to be very difficult to avoid at $8,900 unless his ownership gets into like the thirties or something like that. Uh, then you get Justin Thomas, who we kind of talked about, 10-7. This, this kind of bears it out. Sergio, Rory, and Keegan round out the top six of strokes gained approach. Um, if there's any value here, Adam Scott at 87. Keegan is at 69. Uh, even Jim Furyk down at 7,000, I guess. I, I'd be a little bit concerned about Furyk because this is a long par 70. Um, that he might not be able to kind of hang with some of these guys. A lot of, a lot of long par fours here. But, you know, Hide you know, Hideki jumps off, uh, even Sergio jumps off here. Sergio started to play a little bit better at times last week. And then I do want to show um, birdie or better as well. Because you're getting four rounds, I want to see if we can find anybody who might jump off here. Uh, a lot of the same names that we've chatted through. So JT is number one. Gary Woodland does offer some value at 8,100. Rory again. Uh, Bryson at 88, and then you get the big boys, right? Kepka, Rom. So not too many big surprises here in the birdie or better department. Um, the guys that you'd expect them to be here are here, but I, I, I really think it's going to be critical and the stats kind of bear out that this is going to be critical for this week and any other no cut event.
All right, I'm going to wrap it there. That's the preview for TPC Southwind. Again, um, you know, go back to the beginning of the video if you want to enter the draw for tools into DFS on demand. I'll be tweeting out a bunch of stuff. There's a lot of great data for TPC Southwind, so uh, make sure you follow me. It's at DFS on demand. There'll be more videos coming out this week. Um, best of luck. I'll talk to you guys soon.